Okay, many of you will not know uh, Melissa simply because we've got so many people here uh, that um, aren't able to make it to our regular youth services retreats, and that's a great thing. Um, so uh, just briefly, um, Melissa Caspreed, Dr. Melissa Caspreed, uh, teaches library science at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. Um, and she has uh, presented before at the Youth Services Retreat um, and usually on some aspect of um, YA uh, literature. And so I think you can look forward to a, a great um, presentation here with the expertise that she will bring. So it's all yours, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a big thank you, um, Todd and Scott. Um, because of my teaching, I often teach, you know, I teach young adult literature every year. And so I read young adult literature constantly. And as a result, I get these ideas. And but every so often, Scott or Todd contacts me and say, hey, could you have something to talk about? And so I get to take these ideas and it motivates me then to go like, explore and develop these ideas besides just go, hmm, I wonder about this. And one of the things I've been wondering about lately is leadership with our youth. Um, we see a lot of things in the news about what's happening, going on in the world, and we see teens out there being active. We see Greta Thunberg, you know, speaking for the, in front of the United Nations on climate change. We see teens in our streets protesting for various causes and issues. And so I've been wondering about leadership. And really, even before all those media images were hitting us, there were a couple of books that made me go, hmm, a little bit. One of the first ones, let's see, there we go, a little advancing travel here, was Dime by E.R. Frank. And I'm not sure how many people remember this from a few years ago. It is about teen sex trafficking. So it's a gritty book. It is not necessarily a happy book. And I remember talking with my colleague, Chris Hefner, who is in the Lincoln Public Schools, heads up their library um, program there. And we were talking about this book and whether we should include it in our reading. And I'm going, mm, this is not like, this is a heavy book. And she reminded me that when teens turn 18, we suddenly expect them to help solve the problems of the world or be partners in that. But how can they do that if they've never seen the problems? So then I also started thinking, well, that's true. Young adult literature is often a way for us to you know, safely approach an idea or you know, from a distance try to understand something. So that books will do that, but will they teach them then strategies or skills for being those leaders to solve those problems. And as I was pondering that, I came across this book, Grayling Song by Karen Cushman. And when I first picked it up, I thought, oh, this will be a light fantasy, which I should have known better, right? Karen Cushman, right? I should have known. She always adds some meat to her, her books. And I'm reading this book. And Grayling Song is the story of a young woman. She lives with her mother. Her mother is the healer for her village. And one day Grayling comes across her mother and her mother is rooted in her spot. She can't move, literally rooted because she's becoming a tree. A sorcerer has come by and put place to curse on her. And the only way to save her mother is for Grayling to go after this sorcerer and retrieve the book of potions and spells that belong to her mother that the sorcerer stole. And as she goes on this journey, he starts picking up different people along the way. I guess there's a little Wizard of Oz element here, except the people in Grayling songs that Grayling picks up along the way are not quite as helpful as those in the Wizard of Oz. And situations arise and Grayling's looking to these adults to be like, well, do something. And they just kind of fumble and they don't know what to do, but Grayling each time realizes that it's up to her to do something. So as she does it, each situation arises, she grows in her confidence in herself. She realizes what needs to be done. 
she does save her mother. But along the way, this journey, she realizes who she is and that she can do these things, she can lead and you know, impact change, make change happen. She can save her mother, she can save her community because it turns out there are other healers who are being um, attacked as well. So that's where this idea of leadership came from, was those two books, two very different books. And this is an opportunity for me to go exploring them. But before I get into that, I'd like to ask you a question and for you to think about. And if you would, please, you could just put your answers in the chat. But if you were in a situation, kind of such as we are now with a pandemic or something else that some sort of adversity, and you have to follow someone to find your way out of this. Which character from young adult literature would you follow? Harry Potter or Katniss Everdeen? So if you would just kind of maybe in the chat, put who you would vote for. And while you're doing that, think about why. What unique characteristics do they, it looks like we're kind of getting even split here. I see Katniss, Katniss, and then I see a Harry, Katniss, no question. Harry, Katniss. And we voted for both, we could team up, right? So think about why, what it is about these characters that you would follow them. You know, because both of these characters, neither one of them started out as leaders, Probably if you'd said something to them about that, they would have, you know, laughed in your face, but they definitely become leaders. And how did that happen? So I'm going to understand that and to see if there's other literature out there to guide teens in becoming leaders, I needed to look for a framework that was easy to slot things into, but also was backed up by research. So I looked to Brene Brown, and for those of you who are familiar with her uh, or not familiar with her, she has been a researcher in the area of leadership and organizations for over 20 years. She has this, you know, million, so many millions of views, TED Talk, Oprah loves her. I just saw a headline that Prince Harry and Meghan Markle love her. Um, so she's very popular because her ideas are very approachable. It's very easy to see her ideas and understand her, but it's backed up by research. She's got tons of research to back these things up. And over the years, as she says, in 20 some years of research, she's finally identified after talking to leaders from across all industry, agencies, all types of leaders, she's narrowed it down to four important skills. Rumbling with vulnerability, living to values, braving trust and learning to rise. So I took those four skills and I looked at them and started looking at the books I've been reading recently and seeing which ones teach those things. So I'm going to start with rumbling with vulnerability. So that is, you know, wrestling with insecurities, whatever it is that doesn't make us feel safe in the world. Now, when you first hear about sorry for your loss or you read the description, you might not think that this is a book about leadership. It's a beautiful book written by Jesse Ann Foley. It's about Pup. And Pup is the youngest child in a big family. Right? It's like seven, eight kids, big family. He's the youngest. He's the only one left at home. And he's just kind of getting by life. He's barely passing his classes, well, except art. He is definitely failing art. And as we get into his story, we realize that his family has suffered a great loss. One of his older brothers passed away two or three years earlier, very suddenly due to meningitis while he was in college. And we start to realize that that's, Everybody's just kind of getting by because of this grief. They are still really struggling with it, even though quietly. Although his other brother, not so quietly, because Pup often finds him passed out on the roof of their house, surrounded by beer cans. So this is a very sweet, wonderfully elegant written book. And as Pup 
starts to deal with this, um, you start seeing his growth. He begins to deal with this because of that art class he's failing. His teacher says, gives him a camera and says, just take pictures. You, you failed at sculpture, pottery, painting, every art form imaginable, you failed it. Photography is the only one left. And so he starts taking pictures and he's taking pictures of his family. And as he does this, he starts run, rumbling with those vulnerability and coming to terms with the loss of his family, his brother. And he's able to see and process that grief and come to terms with it. He's able to find his brother, the alcoholic, turns out was kicked out of law school and get him into rehab. He's able to pull the rest of his family together into family group counseling to deal with the loss of his brother. His parents start coming to life again and start paying attention to him. And oh, now they're not so happy about his grades that before they were just ignoring him. But he's really the one who leads the family to healing because he processed and rumbled with his feelings of grief and vulnerability. Now, a very different book, but also deals with that, is Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of this, if you have kids who love Rick Riordan and Percy Jackson and they've read everything and they need a new book, Tristan Strong is it. It's action, constellate all the way through it from the beginning. But this is a middle school kid who's suddenly realizing that when you're in middle school, expectations are higher. And he's recently um, gotten into amateur boxing, but his first match went horribly wrong. He was pummeled and his dad is so disappointed because his dad was a champion boxer and he expected more from his son. Well, Tristan is also dealing with the loss of his best friend who died in a car accident. So not only is he grieving the loss of his friend, he feels guilt because he feels like he should have been able to save his friend. He should have been able to pull his friend to safety. So he's dealing with all this stuff at the beginning of the book. He is sent to his grandparents to live for the summer. And really the only thing, meaningful thing he takes with him to this visit with his grandparents is a notebook. And in this notebook is a collection of stories that he and his best friend collected. These are folklore from West African folklore, uh, African-American folk tales, and they've collected these stories. In the first night in the farm, he realizes a small person or creature is rifling through his book bag and stealing his notebook. He chases this person, creature, whose name is Gum Baby. So it's sort of related to Char Baby from folklore. Gum Baby is rushing out with his notebook. So he chases after Gum Baby into the woods. He gets into the woods where Gum Baby is. He throws a punch and he punches a hole in the sky and falls into another world. In this other world, it's filled with the heroes from the folk tales he wrote about in his notebook. John Henry's there, Bear Rabbit's there. And he realizes or soon learns that by punching a hole in the sky, this land kingdom that he's fallen into is now at the mercy of an evil menace because it can come through that hole. And it's up to him, since he made the hole, to fix the hole. And he has to come to deal with those feelings of inadequacy because he can't box and he's not good enough for this. and He's not even good enough to save his best friend. And he's dealing with all that vulnerability. Along the way, he gathers friends. He goes along his path and he processes that. He gets confident. confident in himself, in his boxing, but also in the stories and the power those stories give him and how they help him deal with the passing of his best friend. So by the end, he is a hero. He leads the rest of the heroes and their crew into battle. And he, using his own story, survives and fixes the whole. And that's just the beginning of a whole new adventure. But it's because he had to deal with all those doubts, he was able to do this and become a leader. They also have to live into their values. Wonder Woman, who's a bigger leader than Wonder Woman, right? In Lori Hall's Anderson's graphic novel, um, illustrated by Leila De du Del Duca, Wonder Woman is 16 years old. It's her 16th birthday. They're celebrating on the aisle where all the Am Amazonians live. 
And this island is surrounded by a protective ba barrier for those who don't know about Wonder Woman. But there's a storm and it rips a hole into this barrier. So suddenly a bunch of refugees who were in the ocean on rafts make it to their shores and Wonder Woman swims out to save them. But they close the barrier before she can get back to the island. And now she's a refugee too. So she lives in a refugee camp in Europe for a while before someone finds her and moves her to New York City um, with a woman and her niece. And when she goes out in the city with the niece to help feed kids who have no food in the parks, they make sandwiches and they take them out. She starts seeing the world. She sees crime, she sees pollution, she sees sexual harassment, homelessness, um, kids starving. She sees all these things and oh, it makes her so angry and so resentful. And that's a key moment with values. Uh, Brene Brown talks about, she knows she's moving away from her values when she feels resentment. And think about our teens, when they're just becoming teenagers, they start seeing the injustices in the world. They start seeing the hypocrisy in the world and many teens become resentful. That's because the values are like, things aren't living up to what they, their value, what the expected values were. And Wonder Woman struggles with this as a 16 year old. You know, when she comes to New York City, she puts away the lasses, she's put away the golden bracelets. Um, but it's not until she brings her values back, she gathers up the lasso, she gathers her bracelets back. She leans into her values and what she believes that she's able to come into her power really, truly, and lead a group into breaking up a child kidnapping ring. So she leads them and solves this problem, but she's not able to do that, she struggles until she accepts the values that she was raised with and the traditions of her family. Ghost voice. Um, I imagine a lot of people are familiar with this, but I had to do it because, again, it's those values. Uh, the quote here, only the living can make the world better, comes on the very last page of the book. Only this story is about Jerome and Jerome isn't living. When the story opens up, Jerome is coming to realize that he is dead, that he has been shot by a police officer while he was playing with a toy gun in a lot. The police officer confused the gun as being real and for Jerome being an adult. And Jerome is, is 12, so he is not an adult. So he realizes he's a ghost. And for some reason, he gets pulled to different people and locations in his community, his grandmother, and he sees her grieve and he sees his best friend deal with his grief. But he's also pulled to see Sarah and he's never met Sarah before. But Sarah is the daughter of the police officer who shot and killed Jerome. So their first interactions are very tense and they talk about what happened. And Sarah loves her father. She believes in her father as she would. You know, her father set out to do good and that was his, his purpose in being a, a police officer. So she really struggles with what happens. But when she comes to talk with Jerome and she learns about what happened and she learns about uh, implicit bias and all these other things that are happening in the world, she's able to see her father she still loves, but she sees that he's struggling with this. And she can help him, lead him to healing, to face the consequences of what he's done, to address them and move forward and work towards something better himself. So while this is Jerome's book, it's Sarah who is leading and Jerome led Sarah based on the values of humanity that they found in common. You also need trust is the fourth one. One of us is lying. I know this was very popular, made all the bookseller list, and you can read a ton of things about it. You know, most of the things written by adults are about this being the Breakfast Club meets Agatha Christie. And you've got, it's a snapshot into teen life and all the, the clicky things that happen and, and all that stuff. But when you read reviews written by teens, they clue into the trust within this book. So in One of Us is Lying, we have four characters. It's told from the viewpoint of these four characters. So they each have a voice in the story. They know each other, but they really don't know each other. They're very different. At first, they seem kind of stereotypical characters, but as we get to know them, and then they get to know each other, we move beyond those stereotypes. And they're not able to solve the mystery. 
which is a murder. And they've been accused of this murder. They're all suspects. They're not able to move beyond that until they start trusting each other and working together. They start out keeping secrets and get nowhere. But as they start to get to know each other and trust each other, that's when things start to happen. That's when they start working as a team. And you can't have a team without trust. And they come together, they trust, and they're able to figure out who the murderer is. So if you noticed in this review here, it talks about, and this was written in a review, this quote is from a review from a high school newspaper. So this is the teenager saying the importance of trust. This book is about the importance of trust. You know, whereas most of the adults were saying, oh, this was a fun read. The teens really picked up this being about trust. And this book is about truth. This for teens is so important. That integrity, the truth of integrity here. And so one of us shows and demonstrates you have to work as a team and you can't work as a team without trust. Another one, it's like one of us is lying, but it's in space. Okay, Aurora Rising series. The first two are out, the third one is not out yet. But the first one, Aurora Rising, really the leader there is Tyler. This book is told from the viewpoint of seven different people. These, they all live from different planets. Some of them are, I don't know if you'd say it's different species, but they're aliens from different planets. So there's a lot of uh, metaphor and symbolism with cultural differences and ethnic differences, racial differences kind of going on in there. But even though this is told from the viewpoint of seven different characters, um, Tyler sort of stands out as the leader. He is the star graduate of the Space Academy. And he is in line to pick together the next day his crew. And he's going to pick the cream of the crop. Except the night before, he is sent out. Um, he's out flying around in his spaceship and he, he hears a distress beacon. So he goes to save this person. And by the time he gets back, the selection is done and all the best people have been taken. And he's left with this ragtag crew of people. And the book shows how they have to come together, learn to trust. He has to trust them as a leader, trust that they will do what they need to do, and they need to learn to trust him. So the first book is really about trust and gathering together as a team. And the second book, they're a team, but Tyler becomes separated. So now it's a whole other kind of trust. It's trust in abilities. So even though Tyler is gone and no longer this pointed leader, now the others have to step up and lead. And what I love about this book is it teaches that you can lead from any position. You don't have to just be the assigned boss or have the title. You lead from wherever you are. And at different times in Aurora Burning, each character has an opportunity to lead, to step up and the others trust them. This is the situation that calls for your skill set, you lead, and they trust that. And at the end, though, that trust comes to question. Well, I'm not going to tell you because that would spoil it. So you check it out. But trust is just thick within these stories, these two books. Finally, you have to learn to rise with all this going on. You have to figure out how to move forward. Jean Luen Yang's new graphic novel, well, it's a graphic memoir. It's not a novel, it's a true story. It's part his memoir of his decision to move from teaching math full time in a private high school to really being a graphic novelist. But it's also the story of that high school's basketball team. And Yang is not a sports fan, does not know sports, really has no interest in basketball. But for some reason, this team captures his attention as he's trying to figure out what his next story will be. So he starts following the team and he learns that this team is highly successful, except every year and they, for 20 years, they get all the way up to that championship game and every year they lose. But every year they go back and they start over again. And so while Yang is trying to figure out and deciding what he's going to do, if it's worth him putting himself out there going full-time as a novelist, can he support his family? All those questions of failure and rumbling with that. That basketball team's doing the same thing. Can they do it? Can this be the final year? They try, they practice, they lose, they pick themselves up again. 
and they move forward. Uh, this is also the story of a basketball team from 20 years earlier and the previous coach and a scandal that kept him from coaching ever again. And a player who was on that team then, who's the coach now. This is just a tapestry of stories of people who are really stepping forward. They're learning to rise. They are vulnerable, but they know what their goal is. They have their values and those are situated in what they want to work towards. They trust each other and they are taking a step forward. There's a symbolism of stepping, taking a step, one more step forward within this book, and they're all learning to rise. So it's a very rich, multi layered story within here. Lots of things happening, but consistently with all these things that are happening, it's the idea of learning to rise. Finally, we have Chirp by Kate Messner. This is a mystery, but there's more going on here, of course. Mia is moving back to Vermont with her parents. This is a middle grade book. She's moving back to Vermont with her parents to help with taking care of her grandmother. Her grandmother has some health issues, but she also has a cricket business. Yes, a cricket business. I mean, chirp, chirp, crickets, right? She raises crickets for food, you know, chocolate covered crickets. You can dry them, put them in powder and bake with them, They're high in protein. This is her business. And Mia believes in her grandmother, loves her grandmother. So she's going to help her do this. Well, it's summer vacation. So the catch is her mom says, you just can't do that. You have to go to camp. And so she chooses a young entrepreneur's camp and an extreme sports camp. And she uses a young entrepreneur's camp to help her grandmother. And as she's doing this and learning about the business, she realizes that someone's trying to sabotage her grandmother's business. And she's going to find out who it is. As she does that, and she works with the young entrepreneurs group, she gathers friends and her friends start helping her with this. At the same time, she's got to go to that sports camp. And this is where we learn that she used to be a gymnast, a very good competitive gymnast. Only she fell and broke her arm and can't compete anymore. And she's very nervous about doing anything physical, about hurting herself. So slowly the people at this camp get her to just sort of hang and slowly build up her strength. She doesn't have to do all the other extreme sport things, just do some things so she gets stronger. So as she's going through this, solving the mystery, making friends, we learn that there's more to this injury than we thought. At this gymnastics um, gym that she was at previous before moving back to Vermont, there was a coach. And this coach, he really liked her. And at first the attention was great, but then this, the attention started feeling creepy. And he, then he'd say something inappropriate. And then maybe there was some touching that was inappropriate. And it turns out she fell because of being bothered by this coach. And she never said anything. She didn't feel safe telling anyone this. But she gathers courage. You know, she's vulnerable through all this, but working with her grandmother, helping her grandmother face her fears. She faces her fears. She gets trust from her friends. She figures out what's really important. And she finally is able to tell her mother what happened at the gym. And she's able to heal. They figure out who solved the mystery. They start a whole new marketing campaign for her grandmother. So the business is saved. But most importantly, she's healed and she's learned to rise. This coach wasn't going to keep her down any further. She's learning to get back up and get back out there. So what did I learn from all this book, these books? As I was going through these different categories, rumbling with vulnerability, learning about values, braving trust, learning to rise, you're probably all thinking, well, I know a book that did this, and I know a book that did that. And this book did that. All books do this. And that's what I realized. Young adult lit books all talk about leadership. I think it's summed up by a quote that Brene Brown talks about a lot. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points fingers or how, how the strong man stumbles. Oops, I'm trying to minimize this here. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, 
and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. This is what young adult literature teaches our kids. Almost all young adult literature teaches our teens to be in the arena. They teach them how to deal with these insecurities that they feel and these vulnerabilities. It teaches them how to figure out their values are and how important those values are to keeping them as a guidepost and keeping them on track of what they want to achieve. Young adult literature teaches our teens about trust and how sometimes trust doesn't work out and it gets misplaced, but other times trust is absolutely crucial for teamwork and for moving forward. And finally, it teaches teens how to move forward, that you have to get up again. You don't just stay down. All of young adult lit books, those kids are getting back up again and again. They're getting into the arena. And so when I looked for like books on this book will teach young adult and this will teach this skill. No, young adult lit books all teach these leadership skills. And I was so surprised by this. And it just gives me heart when people start saying, oh, you read young adult lit. It tells me how much richness is actually in this and what we're missing um, when we discount it too much. So anyway, that's what I found out, my thinking on Young Adult Lit. I think I'm still within time to take any comments or questions. All right, so if anybody has any questions or comments, um, you can type into the chat. Or if you're willing to, you can unmute your own mic and um, ask a question of Melissa. Or... or maybe you have a favorite book that you really think speaks to this idea of leadership. Mm. I mean, we're all looking for new titles, right? <laughs> what was my favorite book of the group? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, it's always a different place and time. Uh, I am just so getting into the action and adventure of Tristan Strong and the Aurora uh, Chronicles. Those are just action, action, action. But I gotta tell you, I fell in love with Sorry About Your Loss on Pop and his grief and in his journey. I mean, there was so much stuff I left out, you know, because I couldn't tell you all. Um, but that was just, I thought a glorious book. And the author is the previous um, Michael Prince Award winner, I believe. So, uh, you know, I can see she's earned it. She's probably in contention again. It's just a beautiful book. Um, and then I always have a soft spot for Karen Cushman. Did I find more male or female leaders or is it fairly equal? Um, it is not equal, but it's mostly because I think there's a preponderance, preponderance, ooh, big word for me, uh, of female characters in young adult lit. I think we're, we really see a lot of male characters in uh, middle grades, um, but there's something about once we get into those upper teen years that I don't think we see as many um, books about males, which is a shame. I think we should, um, we really need to kind of watch out for that. So unfortunately, I think that's why it's more female. But of course, you know, somebody might have a different perception. Um, I really, but that probably the next thing is like, somebody do a count and see how many male and female characters are there in young adult lit. But I think there's a, you know, they're mostly girls there. And that's probably because they're a larger proportion of the readership of young adult literature. Other questions or book recommendation? Peter Nimble and His Fantastic Eyes by Jonathan Ox. Wonderful, amazing book. Okay, I'm writing that down now. Peter Nimble and his fantastic eyes. Thank you. Would you say that's uh, middle grade? Or is it upper? Do we see diverse leaders, um, leaders from diverse backgrounds in YA lit? I do. I do see a, a, a diverse leaders, and I may not have been as, as good as about covering them as, as, as I wanted. Although I did have some diversity in there. 
um, we're starting to see so much more rich diversity out there. Like I almost included um, Linda Sue Park's uh, prairie lotus in here, um, but I haven't finished it yet, so I didn't. <laughs> was a lot of it, but I do. And I've also just started um, the only two black girls in town. And Genesis Rising, I do think we will see. Uh, we are seeing more and more. There's a recognition of that. Is there is there more to go? Yes, there's definitely more room for growth, but we are seeing much more diversity. It's easier to find those diverse titles than it was, I know, for my class a few years ago. 812 for Peter Nimble. Thank you. Sophie Choir and the Last Story Card. Oh, yeah, good example. She keeps them in um, YA Lit because of the battles. You know, I, I never thought of myself being like a battle kind of girl, but I read some books with just some amazingly written battles that just blow me away. So, um, yeah, I get that, that reasoning totally. Any other questions? Oh, another book that just popped into my head um, related to Scott's question. Um, Patron Saints of Nothing is um, Randy Rebay. It's his second book. I think he's got another one coming out. He writes from a Filipino American perspective, which is a totally fresh perspective that we haven't seen. Um, Patron Saints of Nothing was a mystery, partially, but also definitely realistic fiction. And everything that Liz said about friendship and with Peter Nimble was totally true about this, but this is set in the Philippines against the backdrop of the drug war in the Philippines. So it's very much an upper level high school book, um, but everything about knowing who your friends are, trusting your instincts, um, figuring out your own strength, Questioning, I mean, it's all in that book. How do I choose what way booklets to leave? Um, I signed up for every free newsletter I can get. So I follow, um, School Library Journal has a free newsletter that gets sent to you. So I can't afford the subscriptions to these. So I sign up for their newsletters and they usually have a weekly, like these are the top YA lit books. I do the same thing with Booklist who, has several different free newsletters and so they'll have you know the best reviews of the week but the best books of the week and then they'll do thematic ones the best sports books this best this and they'll divide them between the top 10 art adult ones and the top 10 youth ones and so I really follow those a lot and um, that's where I start getting those and then I'll, I'll you know willow out from there Any other questions? I know you're on a schedule. I can't remember when the next person is up. Um, no, actually, you're fine. Um, officially, okay. um, which is unusual because I usually go over. I think it's pretty <laughs> pretty accurate for me. No, they have on the official schedule. It says a break at 1:50, and then it's for 10 minutes, and then um, the next session would start right at the top of the hour at two. So, okay. not a problem. You know, one book that um, I adored when someone was asking my favorite book that didn't make my list because I was trying to keep it short with just two categories was Rainbow Rails Pumpkinhead. Pumpkinhead. Just thought that was a beautiful graphic novel and just, just happy. You know, if you need a happy book, that was just happy. Yes, I see some other enthusiasm for pumpkin heads out there. I, I will share myself. Um, this is Krista, if anyone's wondering, uh -huh. at the Library Commission. Um, I actually just read Tempest Toss two days ago. Mm. For um, here at the Library Commission, we do a Friday Reads um, blog post, and I'm due for mine tomorrow, and decided ah. to read um, my own copy of that. And I, re I definitely I really enjoyed it. I 
well, I'm a big graphic novel fan and comics mm -hmm. and Wonder Woman, of course, in general. And I really liked the retelling of her origin story. Um, I thought it was so in unexpected. In a very timely way that, uh, like we said at the beginning, everything's going on in our country and the world right now. I think it's a very important book for uh, that a lot of um, teens, white, young adults should definitely read. It pulls together a lot of, you know, I don't know how she does it. She's just an amazing writer, but she pulls together so many different things that are happening in the world so easily. Mm -hmm. It made without sense. getting muddy. Yeah, it made sense. It really was. I'm a little wondering and, and worried. It kind of left it open ended at the end as well. And I'm wondering, is there going to be a sequel? I want to know what they do. <laughs> I, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Me too. I'm like, what would they do next? How would she? And the whole Steve Trevor thing just was. Oh, that was, yes. That was I'm not going to give it away, but that was amazing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to give it away, but it was clever. Yes. Just in general, any great reads that someone just can't wait to say, this was fabulous, you should read it. I guess, Sally, you're going to be doing some of that later. I don't know if you want to give any spoilers. Gonna, I was just going to ask if you were going to stay around because I have painfully taken the 15 minutes I have and I'm trying to cram 10 to 12 to don't tell them 14 books in it. So um, I won't tell anyone. <laughs> I can only stay in for a little bit because I have office hours. I have to be on Zoom for oh, office right. hours this yeah. afternoon. Yeah, so. and, and look at my handout and, and this will I be will. recorded can listen to me it's only 15 minutes so. i definitely will because i have to come up with next year's reading list soon the paper okay. girl of paris oh and the filipino book was the patron saints of nothing um the author's last name is um i'll, I'll put it in the chat because i'm not sure uh, i'm pronouncing it right uh, Bay, perhaps but it's the patron saints of nothing is the book. Paper Girl of Paris. Got it. Thank you. Oh, yes, and the commission, uh, Krista, somebody has put the link to the handouts. Yes, I was just typing that in there, too. Yeah, there's a, it, it'll be in the slides coming up, but that's, um, I think Todd might have emailed it to everybody, too. But, um, yeah, Sally, there's the teen books, 10 books in 10 minutes, and the top youth books. Mm -hmm. I assume that might be also Dana's, we'll see. so you can get the list there. Excellent. Towers, oh, another Jewel Parker Rhodes, Towers Falling. Don't know that one either. You know, isn't Young Adult Lit amazing in that you feel like you've read and read and read, but there is so much out there that is so rich now. And I don't, I think we're so fortunate in this time that it is just becoming richer and richer. Have you read Black Brother, Black Brother, which I think is by Jewel Parker Rhodes also? It's new this year. And mm -hmm. Another one I recommend. But I, I think I have heard it, but you've read it. You recommend it, huh? Yes, it's not on my list for now, but it's on my longer list that I'll be doing in the future for the Library Commission <laughs> commercial. I, I did see it on a list, but I haven't read it or know anything about it. But that's good to know. But I'm actually start again on my ever growing list of reads. Um, I can Early tell you. Fire and Florence. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. The new Golden Sower lists are just about ready to be announced and they haven't already. And you might recognize a title or two. Uh, I'm not saying. Mm -hmm. Oh, intrigue. Awesome. I just want to say thank you for uh, starting us out 
on our virtual youth retreat. Um, oh, thank you. So. And thank you for, like I said, letting me explore these ideas and giving me the motivation to actually dig into them. And I think. I think it's time for a break, huh? I think it's time for us to take a break and get our next speaker set up, ready to present. Uh, unless I'm missing something, Todd, you're the keeper of the schedule today, so. No, you're not. That's exactly right. And uh, thank you again, Melissa. Thank you.